I'm Ron, I'm an alcoholic. My sober date is December 28th, 1985. About every five to seven years in recovery, I would get stuck. And there were a whole lot of people who would explain to me that that meant that I was doing something wrong. Thankfully, I've had a really, really good sponsor for 27 years who said, no, Ron, the purpose of the steps, the purpose of recovery, is to bring you to the next jumping off place. You're here stuck with this because of success, not failure. The steps have done what they're designed to do. They've brought you to a new place. Something new is blocking you off. And where that fits in is when I go to the fourth step, which is much misunderstood in my experience. It says that the fourth step's purpose is to find where we are blocked off from power. It's not ultimately an accounting of our misdeeds and all that stuff. If our problem is lack of power, and the solution is power, then what the steps are designed to do is to figure out where we're blocked off from that power, whatever it may be, unleash the power in our lives so that things can be changed. Reed and I were just talking that the, the purpose of this deal is a psychic change. And somebody else and I were chatting, if all I did was get sober, I'm not sure I would have stuck around. Fortunately, my particular path guaranteed that about every five to seven years I would go into another cycle of suffering, which was my ticket to the next level over and over again. So, a couple of things about Bill Wilson wrote, and I want to make sure I ground this in. One is he wrote that article, The Next Frontier, which is where he introduces the idea of emotional sobriety. It was published in um, Great Mind in 57. What a lot of people don't know is he also wrote a letter in 1957 that said the purpose of the moral inventory is to discover how we were damaged by life. So here he is, 20 years in, the founder, co-founder of AA, completely talking differently about this idea of what we're here for. And he introduced this idea of emotional sobriety. And then he goes in to say that the problem we have, and he was talking about this crippling, he had a terrible problem with depression at that point. Most of you probably know that. And what he was writing about was how he was walking the world with crippling dependencies, that's a quote. And that when he would be disappointed, he would fall into cycles of depression. So what he was pointing us to, this emotional sobriety idea, was not like just being cool and managing my emotions. But what he was pointing us to was getting to the root of why we end up upset. And his proposition was, if you deal with why you're getting upset, you won't get upset anymore. The upset is a symptom that tells you you've fallen somewhere. So we've got to completely change our mind about how I'm having a problem and that means I'm doing something wrong. I've got a problem which means there's something new that's being revealed here for me. Something that needs my attention. We are talking a couple of us beforehand because what happens with each restoration, I talk about progressive recovery a lot, I'll tell you why that is here in a moment, um, is because it's all designed to get things better. There was a speaker many years ago, one of the founders of the adult children's movement, which is how I got into recovery before I found out I was an alcoholic, who said that what's supposed to happen when we do this over time is it's supposed to go from bad and bad to bad and good to good and good to good and better to better and better. That that's the design. It's supposed to get better. That's the design of this program of recovery. And wherever we are, there's always another better. So what happened to me in this whole idea of progressive recovery is I would, which is, there's a website out there, it's all free content, freely given, freely received. You can sign up for it, you can visit it, whatever. There's a whole bunch of material out there. But the basic proposition behind progressive recovery is it's a progressive disease, which means we need to progress in our recovery. The explanation is pretty simple. I had a, an older guy in uh, recovery who was a, sort of a mentor to me who said the problem with this life we live in sobriety is we're actually on a very slowly, imperceptibly moving escalator taking us down and we don't know it. That every day that we're not moving forward, we're actually going backward. 
but we can't see it. We don't know it. And the next thing you know, you're down in the proverbial basement, not sure how you got there, what happened. And the answer was we weren't progressing, we weren't moving forward. It wasn't enough to just stay stationary. Well, for me, that meant that I had to have a succession of things that got my attention. And it meant that I would have to practice the recovery program with increasing degrees of depth practice experience. So those are just going to give you the highlights. Um, the highlights of that were what really got me moving in this direction. I got remarried in five years because I figured I had it all figured out, and then I found out very quickly I did not have it all figured out. Uh, the problem was that my second wife came with two little girls, and at seven years sober, I started emotionally abusing those girls. So it's two years married, I was ill-equipped to be a parent, and I started mistreating them. I've been told I shouldn't call it emotional abuse because that would offend some people in the rooms, but let's just be honest. I was ill-equipped, I didn't know how to deal with this marriage and these kids, and I started mistreating those kids. And I knew better, and I could not do better. And I would talk about it in meetings, and people would say, you don't talk about that stuff here. It's like, I'm going to kill myself. I better be able to talk about this here. And I worked with my sponsor, and he'd just go, dude, you're powerless. It's like, but I know better, he said, but you're powerless. Well, that got me into therapy in some ways that complemented my recovery. My sponsor was a big fan of that. Because I had some childhood business to take care of. Um, many of us have childhood traumas we don't know about. I didn't know about it. Did some pretty good work on that. The amend I made, two amends that I made on that that are important. One is I divorced her. Yeah. <laughs> right answer. <laughs> I mean, that's it, but I mean, really, I had picked poorly because of the damage in my own history. The result was I couldn't pick better than I picked. She's a lovely woman, just not one for me. I kept the kids. They were 8 and 10 when I married their mom. Um, I'm just back on vacation with one of them. They're now 42 and 40. So the kids stayed, which is a kind of emotional sobriety, the wife had to go. So that's a fast forward. So I'm cruising along, I've divorced her, I'm good to go, right? Except the next woman showed up. There's a pattern here. And then there was an next one. And yes, there was an ex. And they kept running off the rails. And I'm in sobriety. I'm working the steps, I'm sponsoring, I'm being sponsored, I've got a therapist, I'm doing all the things I know how to do. By now I'm well into Al-Anon, I'm well into ACA, and I can't figure this thing out. And my sponsor, God bless him, Sam, who came from Texas, would say, well, damn Ron, I guess you're powerless over this too. So at 17 years sober, I went to inpatient treatment in a place in Arizona that deals with relationship addictions. Because it turns out that at 17 years sober, what was being revealed to me was some underlying childhood damage. There's Bill's language again, trying to figure out how we were damaged by life, which for many of us happens when we're children, because we don't exactly have great caregivers. It's being revealed to me at 17 years sober, I go in for a week worth of inpatient treatment, and I'm diagnosed as a love addict, which is very unmanly, I might add, <clears throat> which is why I share it. Because it turns out, I had a deep imprint, it turns out, before I was alcoholic, I was codependent and love addicted because of a broken relationship with my mother. She's a fine woman, she's now long gone, this is not about her. I ended up damaged as a result. And that damage set me up for a drink, it set me up for tobacco, which almost killed me, it set me up for all kinds of problems with relationships, so I got into treatment at 17 years, and what do you suppose I did? You want to bet? Yeah. I found the next female. Because <laughs> you can go do inpatient treatment and not be done with it. So I had to work my way through that one. That actually got me to Greenville, South Carolina, which is how I got connected to Pavilion. Reed, thank you again for all the opportunities you all afford me to talk about my experience trying to cope with this. And in Greenville, because I didn't know anyone, all I knew was higher power had moved me there, and I got cornered. I finally had to stop and be with myself and do some work I had there to form and unwilling to do. Deep, deeply embedded damage within me. 
damage that had convinced me there was something so profoundly wrong with me that I was not with the girl. Which is incredibly self-centered. <laughs> I believed higher power could repair you, but that I was so deeply damaged that higher power could not repair me. That was the work that needed to be, that is a very different set of step prayer. Has nothing to do with what I'm doing or not doing. Has everything to do with what I believe to be true about me that is undermining my life. Now at the time, I'm really successful and things are going well because on one level it all works fine, but there's a whole bunch of other stuff going on that gets revealed to me in Greenville, South Carolina. Then, five years later, you know, 27, 28, 29 years so, or something like that. Um, I got a chance to do yet one more layer of progressive work, trying to understand how I became this guy. Uh, we were talking before about deepening spirituality. And so uh, something opened up that took me into the pandemic. And for me, the pandemic was one of the most fruitful times of my recovery. It cornered me. I was prepared. I had done enough foundational work. I essentially went into a very deep inner pilgrimage um, that I was actually kind of disappointed came to an end when the pandemic came to an end. I'd never been able to be so okay with myself. So I was doing uh, a workshop out in Southern California. Um, and there's a group of people out there who are doing this progressive recovery stuff. And I go back out once or twice a year. We're doing this recovery deal. And we're doing a debriefing. <coughs> And you know, I was talking about the things that are better in my life, which is what I want to talk about coming back around to emotional sobriety. But then someone said, so Ron, what's your higher power thing now? <coughs> so here I am, I'm like 35 years sober. And I can feel it in my body. If you don't know this yet, there is a deep bit of programming in us which tells you what's going on deep inside us, somewhere between throat and belly. It's hiding down underneath the chocolate ice cream, of which I'm a fan, hiding down underneath the tobacco, down underneath the coffee, excessive coffee. There, there's like this incredible system in here. And this woman, Deborah, asked me, she said, so what's that like? And I had this awareness. This was like two years ago. And I teared up. And I said, oh my god. All I ever wanted <coughs> was to feel like I was connected. And I feel that today. That struck a few people. I realized I'd been repaired in ways that allowed me to feel a deep and profound sense of okayness. Something I never anticipated as the byproduct of the steps. And I can't tell you what I did to get there. I can tell you it came to me as a result of this deep, deeper level of practice with this program of recovery. So let me bring this around to emotional sobriety. And then um, I have a few questions for you all. So Bill Wilson said that emotional sobriety is the state that comes to us when we're not dependent on the world for anything. And then he said the most heretical thing Bill Wilson could say, even my dependency on AA. Because if I need AA to think well of me for me to be okay, I'm screwed. So here's the co-founder of AA saying, even my disruptive dependency on AA is a problem. Because I expect AA to give me things that it cannot, should not, nor will give me. So here's my language for that, based on my experience. I will say it as the affirmative prayer that I prefer to use. Thank you, higher power, that my well-being is not dependent on anyone or anything. Thank you, higher power, that my well-being is not dependent on anyone or anything. Meaning what you think of me has no relevance to my well-being. I do care what you think, because I do want to know. But my well-being is not dependent on it. 
My well-being is not dependent on what happens in the world. Let the world give me lots of practice opportunities. Because the world keeps doing worldly stuff. My well-being is not dependent on the relationships that are or aren't in my life. My well-being is not dependent on anything. That's what, there's the tears. That's what I saw when Deborah asked me, what about this higher power thing? That what this deeper level of work has done is installed a connectedness that means that no matter what, I can be okay. That means I don't ever need to medicate again. Which works on almost everything except the chocolate ice cream. Still working on a few things. <coughs> Put enough stress on me, I will go someplace with it. So here's what Bill was suggesting to us. And this is where I want to begin to talk with you all. That's the foundation of this. What Bill was saying is that no matter what you do, it's all in here. It's all in here. Now, the mistake we make in the meetings oftentimes is we talk about what's my part which infers I've done something wrong. Well, if you change that a little bit and say, how am I getting hooked by this? That takes me into something other than my behavior and into what I believe and perceive to be true about myself. So you frown at me? Oh, I'll use a better one. Here's one that's fun. I do workshops. I do these professionally, too. So. Um, Periodically, someone will fall asleep. Usually after lunch, because they get a belly full of carbs, and it gets hot in the room, and a nap seems to make really good sense. Well, there was a time when I would have assumed that them taking a nap was about me. That's self-centeredness. They're tired. They got carb overload. They need a nap, and I make that about me, which means that I'm dependent on whether or not they stay awake or not which is not in my control and has nothing to do with me because it's carb overload. But if I think that my well-being is dependent upon them staying awake, I'm setting myself up for some kind of a disruption in my emotional well-being. Because I have allowed, unconsciously, for something to set me up. I talk a lot about Velcro. You don't know how Velcro works, right? There's loops and there's hooks and shh, just like that. And you know it's hooking because when you pull it apart, it sounds like, right? That's the sound of the, that's the, sound of the, the, the latching mechanisms. Well, that's like our emotional upsets. We're walking around with a loop. Someone throws out a hook. I get hooked. And then what I do, if I'm like everybody I know, is I go like, that son of a bitch. I blame the hook and disown the loop. The loop's in me, the hook's out there, and believe me, there's always people throwing hooks out. Always people throwing hooks out. So what Bill is suggesting, it's really heretical. That doesn't mean people aren't doing dastardly stuff. That doesn't mean you shouldn't steer clear of some of them. It means that if you're getting hooked, the hook is on you, not them. But mostly what I and most of us seem to do is we want to blame the thing. The person who, quote, unquote, cut me off traffic. Well, that actually virtually never happens. Let me tell you why I say that. Here's the way your brain works. It's like really cool stuff. It turns out your brain makes up stories based on what you think is true. That doesn't mean what you think is true is true. It means you think it's true. And your brain creates a story consistent with that. Cutting me off in traffic is a story we tell if something happens that threatens us, frightens us, whatever. Here's the way the brain works. If you give the brain three alternative explanations, so for example, what if they have a sick kid in the back of the seat, uh, back in the back seat? <clears throat> what if they just put their mom in hospice care and they're distracted? What if that was actually a mechanical malfunction that caused them to veer across? And what the brain will do, if you just give it three alternative explanations, it will stop the story. Because it's just a story predicated on nothing. It's a story based on what we believe to be true. So let me put this in practical recovery framework. I'm going to talk about relationships for a second, and I want to ask you all a few questions. Have you ever wondered why you and others 
seem to keep picking the wrong people. Not just romantically. This happens all the time with people's business relationships, you know, friends they pick, and then you find out later, wasn't much of a friend after all. Don't ever wonder about that. I mean, a classic story, I heard this in a meeting one day when we were talking about relationships and recovery, and, and the guy goes, well, my seventh wife said that, and then he went on to say something. Everybody goes like, seven wives? I'm like, yeah, I got seven wives. Well, you could blame all seven wives, or you could say there's something hooking this guy. Right? So here's the deal. People who are really secure on the inside don't hang out with people who are really insecure on the inside. They certainly don't marry them. People who are whole aren't interested in unwhole people. But if you're walking around thinking you're broken, I know a lot about this particular pattern. My pattern with women was I believed I was deficient and that I must earn love, earn appreciation. The only way that works is to pick someone who's broken. But if they're broken, they're resistant to being repaired. But my job is to repair them, but they won't get better. They all end badly. And here's the funny part, really funny part. So I've done a whole bunch of this work. I thought I had it all figured out. I go to an AA meeting in Austin, Texas with my sponsor. And there's a pretty blonde there. Do you all hear the story again? They go like, I've done my recovery work. She's a pretty blonde. I'm going to go talk to her. I go over, I hear her story, and I am absolutely, for the very first time in my life, aghast at what I'm attracted to. <laughs> She's less than 30 days sober. She's coming off hard drugs and alcohol. She's got three kids at home from three different fathers, all of which she's telling me, right? She got into recovery this time because her fourth kid died one day when she was loaded. And I am deeply attracted to this broken woman. And the problem isn't the broken woman. The problem is I'm deeply attracted to the broken woman. That's in me, not out there. So. When we look at our relationships, they are this wonderful measure of where we're at. Because if you're picking toxic people, if you're picking people who cheat on you, if you're picking people who do you wrong, that's a mirror on us, not a mirror on them. Because we keep picking them, which is a hard, hard bit of medicine. What's beautiful about it is it makes me 100% accountable for my life. If I can no longer accuse you or this or that of being the cause of my disappointment, my discouragement, my frustration, my anger, my resentment, I must deal with me, which means I have to go find out how I'm getting hurt. I must go find out how I'm getting hurt. So I'm going to stop right there for a minute, because I want to hear from you all. So by show of hands, Who's lost their emotional balance over the past week? You're almost all paying attention. Yeah. How many of you have lost your balance today? Your game went up really fast. <laughs> How many of you all lost your balance in the last 45 minutes since I started talking? <laughs> okay. Good. Okay, great. Here's how we think of this in advancing recovery. The question to ask is not what did this guy say that tweaked me. The question is how did what has happened get me tweaked? See, otherwise you're placing your well-being in my hands and you're screwed. I don't know when it's going to run off the rails. I know it will run. That doesn't mean I haven't said something stupid. That doesn't mean I haven't been offensive. That doesn't mean you should steer clear of me. I'm not saying any of that. I'm not suggesting we put ourselves in harm's way. I'm suggesting we own that we are the interpreter of the experience, which means we are the creator of the reality. We are the creator of the resentment. We are the creator of the next drunk. It is entirely within us, usually without our awareness. We don't know 
what it is. All we know is what it feels like. Guy pissed me off. Person cut me off. Boss treated me without respect. My spouse doesn't think well enough of me. My kids don't treat me with the respect that I should be accorded because I'm taking care of them. And all those things. We flip the mirror, which is what the program says. It says right there in the fourth step. Right? Setting aside the wrongdoing of others. What are we bringing to this? Now, just one correction before I ask a few questions of you all. That doesn't mean you've done something wrong. We have got to get over the idea that we do wrong things. I'm sure we do. The issue is what's triggering us. The big book uses two pieces of language. We read them every day. Well, one of them. Many of us have tried to hold on to our old ideas, and the result was nil until we let go absolutely. We read it every week in AA meetings, every meeting, and we completely fail to understand that it's saying, I am bringing to this the story creation. I'm creating the experience. The wrongdoing of others, imagined, fancied, or real, has the power to kill us. So what they're telling us in there is it doesn't matter whether they did it or didn't do it. It doesn't matter. What matters is I got hooked. And I am accountable for being hooked. Which is strong medicine. And unpleasant medicine. Because we want to, okay, here's how he knows. Stay up, put up with my she said, she did, she was story for two years when I was married. Every time we talked, I went through another litany of what that woman had done or not done. Or who she was or wasn't. And finally, he cut through the crap, and he said, well, do you love her? And I said, what the hell kind of a question is that? She's my wife. Of course I love her. And he said, well, you realize love means no conditions, right? And I said, well, but, he said, there are no buts. No conditions. Let's talk about the conditions you hold over her. That was not what I was prepared for. What I was looking for was someone to agree with me that she was being a bad actor. Instead, we went deep into the column four work in the inventory to find out where I was getting hooked by those things and why I married her. She's a lovely woman. This is not to critique her at all. It's to acknowledge that I had selected someone which was like kryptonite for me. So, I'm curious what you're curious about. I'm curious about what you're curious about. I'm curious where you think you might be stuck. I'm curious where you may be getting provoked by these ideas. I'm curious where you may wonder why you can't maintain emotional sobriety on something. And let that sit for a minute. And this is where some of you get to take a deep breath and be honest with yourself. Why would we want to do this? Let me just fill this up. Because the evidence suggests that if we don't clean up the stuff deep down inside us, we're going to get loaded sooner or later for many of us. It doesn't go away. It festers in the dark of the night. So, who would like to ask a question about where you're stuck, or where you're feeling provoked, or where something's not clear about what you're working with? I would ask a different question. I don't think it's a question of trust or not trust. Um, the question I'm always interested in is when we're in a relationship with someone who has whatever challenges they have. Let's just say it that way. I'm interested in why we're in the relationship. I'm not saying get out. The rooms are filled with people who stay in bad and toxic and violent relationships and spend all their time focused on the other person rather than, it's like, what am I up to here? What am I up to here? It's a different question. Because there's something in here. Um, so I guess I have to tell you a quick story about um, a woman who came to one of my workshops. I used to do a bunch of workshops out in the Outer Banks with a group. There's a woman there who was 70, 
two years old and 40 years sober. But she came to the workshop because she had an abusive mother who was 98 years old and had been abusive for all of her life. And everybody in the rooms kept telling her she couldn't ditch a 98-year-old mother. Can you feel that? She was there because she said, I, I cannot permit the abuse any longer. I have got to find a way to get out of this relationship with my mother because it's killing me. And if I don't get it done, she will leave me in reincarnation. She said, I'm going to come back and have to do this shit all over again. So she spent the weekend working on that and she ditched the 98 year old mother. Because 72 years of abuse was enough. So I share that story not because I think you should, I don't have any idea. What she learned is that she was so attached, there's the word from Eleanor, detached. She was so attached to her responsibility as a child that she could not fathom being done with her mom. That's a crippling dependency. Her well-being was dependent on staying attached to an abusive mother no matter what the abusive mother did. And everybody just kept saying, you can't break it, you can't do that, you can't do that, and she needed to do that, and she did, and I, I was... I was so impressed with her ability to say, I can no longer tolerate this abuse, even though it requires me to jilt my 98-year-old mother. So I asked a different question when I'm in there. I was talking to a woman one day, she said, she said, well, shouldn't it be an appropriate expectation that he shouldn't abuse me? And I said, well, isn't that the wrong question? What are you doing being in an abusive relationship? And she went into this and said, no, 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 what are you doing in an abusive relationship? I'm not suggesting you're an abusive house. I really don't know. Um, not mine to judge, but I do ask the question, how am I supposed to something if it is not good for me? Good question. So, and by the way, that's a really good fourth column four in a fourth step in the right? You don't know who they are, what the story is, how it affects you, what our part is, although I hate what our part because it infers you're doing something wrong. I'm much more interested in how we're hooked by this. That's a good question. And by the way, I'm sure from low talks of people's faces, they're now wondering about some relationships in their life, which I, I wonder about some of mine. Okay, who's got a question or something they're wondering? Yeah, so the best place to start with something like this is to go to and do really a, a basic uh, written inventory of the people and what the pattern is, right? So we need data, right? Who are these people and what is, it, what is it that they're doing and what in God's name am I missing? I'll share something I learned from my own work with this because I kept being surprised by people. Um, still sometimes they what I realized was that I tended to view people with two tragic blind spots. One was I assumed they were telling the truth about themselves. The second was I assumed they knew themselves well enough to tell the truth about themselves. And I was often deeply surprised to find out that people were not who they said they were. That's not on them, that's on me. Now, why would I do that? Because I'm deeply codependent from my relationship with my mother, and if I told myself the truth, I would have to deal with things I didn't want to deal with. So I put on blinders, and then I'm surprised by people. So now I have to ask myself over and over again, whenever I'm starting up some new connection, is this person actually who they say they are? There's a strong probability, given my history, they aren't. Do they actually know themselves well enough to represent themselves well enough? There's a strong part pattern in my history that they maybe not. So I have to be deeply skeptical of the people that I'm picking. I have to be deeply skeptical of me picking the people I'm picking. Let me rephrase that. It's not on them, it's on me. So I start with this list of people and look for the pattern and go like, oh dear God, I just keep doing it over and over and over and over again. 
and I can pick them out. I can pick them out of a lineup. Any of you, you ever have this experience? Some of you, I'm sure, have done dating sites. I've given up on them because it just doesn't work for me. The reason is because I can look at a hundred women and pick the one who's sick. It is uncanny. I've not even met them, and I can re I can read their profile and go, that's the one. And then I date her ten times and go like, oh dear God, what have I done? <clears throat> There's something about how we pick. There's actually a body of work called Imago Theory, Imago Therapy, um, by a guy named Harville Hendricks, who says that we walk the world with a set of eyes based on what we experience with our caregivers, which is why people who were abused as children keep picking abusive people. Because that's what they, that's the imago, that's the imprint they got, like a little duck that follows a dog, right? They imprint on that and we keep repeating it. And we don't know we're doing it, God bless us, we just don't know any better. So I start with the list, I start asking myself the questions. Now if you want to have a lot of fun with this, um, I experimented with this a lot. I would go to AA meetings and I would watch for people I was drawn to. And then I would start paying attention to what they said to see if my predictor was predictive. And it was. The people I was drawn to were invariably people I should steer clear of. Invariably. Until it got healed enough that I could pick differently. It's the broken picker problem, right? Does that make sense? Yeah. Really what we're trying to do is to do a four-column inventory at a depth that we've never taken it to before. Column four is the, what am I doing here? What's going on? How am I getting hooked? And I'm not looking at my misdeeds, sins of omission or commission. I'm looking at how I'm getting hooked. Because I'm bringing something to this connection which is setting me up. It's really good news. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, please. Yeah, so for those of you who are newer in sobriety, this is kind of an advanced question. So stay with me here. Right, this is not exactly straight up recovery stuff. What happens in about 53 is we're supposed to be moving into our peak. It's what the data now shows. I, long story short, I know a lot about the data about, about how our lives go. What's supposed to happen around 53, actually 56 to 62 is when it all comes together and we're supposed to be our most demonstrative self in the world. And in order to do that, you gotta let some stuff go, which is what I hear you say. The problem is that we can't create that next incarnation using the toolkit that we had that got us here, right? So achievement can't get you there. Achievement's great if you're 27 years old building a life. Achievement's great if you're 35, trying to grow a family, have a career, pay your bills, stay sober, it's all, it's all fine. But what happens when you get to that point is you have a different, what they refer to as a different developmental question. And so the question then becomes, I'm going to try and put this in the steps. The question then becomes via the 11th step, um, what is it I am supposed to be, not do, because doing is associated with achieving. And probably one has to sit with that a lot, and it's very disquieting. Yeah, the, the people who study this stuff a whole bunch, which they're not in recovery, but they're doing really good work. What they say, that big side was, some of you think this is crackpot stuff, that's fine. Um, what they say is your soul is trying to get your attention, and it no longer speaks in the language with which you are familiar. So you have to learn a different way of listening. Does that make sense, Zach? So let me, let me put this in recovery. Once you get far enough into the, the solid recovery stuff, we were talking about this. Once you get into the solid, once you get to a certain point, Bill Wilson called AA a spiritual kindergarten. Now there are people who can follow it for a lifetime, and it works fine, and that is great. And there are some of us that doesn't work for them. What we're compelled to do is to use it as a springboard to go find something else. We were talking about um, 
deeper spirituality. We talk about psychic changes. We talk about what, what are we going to do with this life we've been given. And so we have to go into different places. Fortunately, I had a sponsor who encouraged me to do that. So James Hollis is a renowned psychologist who has studied this whole life course thing. Yeah. I realize you're living. What's this got to do with recovery? It's about your life. Emotionally sober for the life that wants to be you. The point is to clear away the blockages so it can show up in the ways it needs to show up. Go ahead. <laughs> that for a lot of us is incredibly uncomfortable. I'm trying to answer the question like, okay, so like, what? What? Um, and you will have your own unique answer to that. But what I have learned is that unique, whatever it is going to be for you to be, won't find us without us dealing with blockages, whatever the blockages are. And then, yeah, and then, and then my personal story and personal experience is that there's another, there's another level, there's always been another level for me to engage at next. By the way, I've tried to ignore them, but the levels won't let me ignore them. They just won't. Yeah, so get several hands fly up over here. Go ahead and then we're here. Trauma, trauma treatment. Okay. Yeah, I had to do, some of us need to do, there's a, the, the one that's most often used is called EMDR, eye movement desensitization and reprocessing reprogramming. You can write back to you, I see your hand, yeah. Um, so Emily, um, what happened was that stuff was deeply embedded in me, and what I needed was, the woman who did it with me was in 12-step recovery, and she took me through a series of trauma treatments where we brought that stuff up. And I'll just tell you the honest truth about what happened. What happened was I remember what it was like to be two years old and at peace with everything. I wasn't born restless, irritable, and discontented. I acquired it. I was born whole. And I actually literally went back and I could feel it in my body right now. What it felt like before I had a need to escape myself. And it was an experience, not a thought. And trauma treatment did that. So a really important point in there. We weren't born restless, irritable, and discontented. We, we acquired it somewhere along the way. That's an interesting thing for us to be curious about. We come right over to you, but first go ahead. Yeah, so again, back that I know code. Yeah, that anger tells us there's something not resolved. That's all it tells us. Doesn't mean there's something wrong with you, it means there's something something not resolved. So the inventory is to go underneath the anger to find out what's fueling the anger. And I have no idea what it might be, but the anger is a symptom. It's like the iceberg thing. And anger is a symptom of something. Um, now, I know that classical AA would say we've got to get done with the anger because it will get us drunk. And certainly early in recovery, that's probably a pretty good idea. But over time, if we don't get at that stuff, it metastasizes us. And it's the story behind over the years with Sam's encouragement. Sam would encourage me to talk to people who went back out and ask them what happened. And the answer always is there's something cooking and they don't know what to do with it. They think it's because they stopped going to meetings, sash because they lost faith in the program because something like that. It's a classic, it's a classic story. So the anger, I mean, I mean, maybe you'll be fine for the rest of your life. I guess it shouldn't be quite so whatever about that. But, but the healing comes when you understand what's fueling the anger. And if you can manage it well, then great. That's much better than acting now. Um, if you want freedom, um, it, it, it asks us to go look at what the source of the anger is. And there's, that just means there's something underneath there that that a good inventory, a good sponsor, maybe a good therapist. Sam used to always say, he'd watched this thing for years, he died last year. Um, 
He said that the most, most common discounting of the big book was page 133, where it says we should seek out professional help. Because it's like, no, I'm good. <laughs> I'm good. That's fine. But then it catches up with us. So i uh, come right over to you, but you, you were, your hand was up. Yeah, um, so I'm going to kind of go a little bit off the charts for a second. Let me come back to AA on this one. So pre-Hindu ancient spirituality said that every human being goes through three levels. They called them the malas. The first one is the belief that I am separate. The second is the belief that there is something wrong with me. The third is that I must do something to fix what's wrong with me. And that every human being gets that. So. Apparently, if that's true, the basic idea that we all have this sense of inadequacy or lack is apparently what it is to be human to some degree. From a 12-step from a point of view, from a recovery point of view, I think the different question is, okay, so with that, as, with that as background, Fred, the different question is, where did I acquire the idea that there's a deficiency in me? that there's a love gap, that there's something wrong with me, that whatever your language may be for it. And almost invariably, that goes back to some experience from childhood. Um, and by the way, let me be really clear, I'm not blaming any parents. They're doing whatever they're doing. But I do have the experience I have, and whether they're well-intentioned or not, my experience is real. You cannot invalidate my experience by telling me my mom and dad did the best they could, which is true. And I experienced neglect. They're both true. And that neglect caused me to think there's something wrong with me. Now, if I told my family is they go, no, our family was fine. Well, I thought that too until I did relationship recovery work. So the question I begin to ask about that, Fred, is okay, it's like I, be, I began, by the way, a lot of this for me had to be done in meditation, because I couldn't. I couldn't jabber my way into it. I had to sit with stuff and wait to see what would reveal itself, what the source of that inadequacy may be. And so how you came to believe this is unique to you, and it's worth exploring. Um, if you have a good sponsor who'd like to do that with you, or if you have a good therapist who'd like to do that with you, um, if you have a good spiritual advisor who'd like to do that, it is a really, really wonderful exploration to find out how we came to those beliefs. I'll tell you how mine came, because I do remember Emily. I remember what it feels like to people. I was sitting on the curb in front of my house watching ants, and it was a sunny day, and all was well in the world. I remember it. I guess it's a memory. I don't know, but I know what it feels like to be old. And then I have this Im image of my mom beckoning to me. Right? So my mom, I don't know what my mom's challenges were, there were challenges. And I made a decision to give myself up to take care of my mom. Because I was two years old and I needed a mom. At that point, it might have made pretty good sense, but then when you're rocking around as a 60-year-old guy, thinking that the purpose of your life is to give yourself up for others, that's a problem. By the way, I believe in service. That's not what I'm saying. I'm not saying don't work with others, don't do service work. But um, <laughs> one of the funniest things is, in recovery is that phrase, that motto, to thine own self be true. Doesn't that sound terribly selfish? <laughs> Isn't it ironic that to thine own self be true is a, is a bedrock principle, and yet it is utterly self-focused? So I, I hope that was useful. So I was talking to a guy long time, long time sober uh, at a Christian foundation. And um, he, he told me, it's amazing the things that you can learn talking to people who aren't running in your lane. He said, if you get the proper translation of the scripture, the scripture says, keep asking, keep seeking, keep knocking. The actual scripture is, knock and the door shall be opened, ask and it shall be given you, and all that. Um, and, and so what he said was, so the secret is in the keeping. We keep knocking, we keep asking, we keep seeking, which I, I really appreciate it because that kind of makes sense to me as well. 
Um, I do want to comment about the programs. What I, what I see today in terms of emotional sobriety, the four primary programs that I have connections to, AA, Al-Anon, ACA, and CODA, all have healed different parts of what needed healing. They're designed for different purposes. Um, and they're interchangeable in some really important ways, too. And I don't know if you all need all four of them. I have no idea what you need. But, um, but I'm not against any of them. I mean, whatever you need, you need. And um, I guess my only encouragement would be to find a really good one where, um, where they can carry a hell of a message to you, whatever that may be. <clears throat> so let's see if anybody else has a call. Yeah, please. Well, I think, first of all, that emotional sobriety is much misunderstood. I think people really think it means I'm just going to manage my emotions and it's going to be all fine. And it's not what he's talking about. He's talking about emotional sobriety is the result of cleaning up on our insides the things that cause us to lose our balance. It could be we have expectations of you. Right? It could be we have beliefs. There are, two, there are two phrases in the big book which I continue to come back to. Old ideas and decisions based on self. Those are things that are inside of us that keep setting us up and as long as they're operative we, we will keep losing our emotional balance. Um, all it takes is enough of a provocation. My suspicion, and this, is, this is just me, right? Um, my suspicion is that I think it's I think it's a tall order for us to consider such a thing. Um, sort of like you were saying, though, but if you're called to it, right? So if this is, if this is what you need to do. And so, I, I mean, sort of like Merle was talking about, if what, if what you found is working well, and your life is in good order, and you're emotionally stable, secure, it's like, great. I mean, truly, great. If, however, life keeps presenting you the next layer, the answer, in my experience, is not to retreat. The answer, in my experience, is, okay, life is presenting me with the next layer. It is for me to lean into. I've got some good Buddhist friends in recovery, and they love talking to Emma Emma says, lean into the sharp points. Uh, that parallel is something Jim Peterson, now dead and long gone, he got 50 some odd years sobriety, would say. He looked just like Colonel Harlan Sanders, you know, the Kentucky Fried Chicken guy. He looked just like him. He would say, he would say, cuddle up to your fears and your pains. Make friends with them. See what they can teach you. Which is kind of Shogun's message, too. And so wherever you get tweaked, wherever you lose your balance, it's like, okay, that's, that's cause for inventory. Yeah, well, the, the bedrock simple AA guidance on that was always how they respond is none of my business. What I had to do with mine was I had to look at my motives for the amends. Most of my motives for amends was I wanted absolution. I wasn't making amends to clean up my affairs. I was making amends to get them to absolve me, to bless me, to like me, to approve of me. So I was, even my amends were mischievous and um and the result was that you know people would i mean the ones who absolved me i'm like is a great event the ones who didn't i'm like because i was i was it turned out that part of what was driving my amends was was not so clean as i thought it was Well, some of, that, some of that is, especially for the sake of the newcomer, because there's no question, some of this stuff, whether it's the complexity or trauma or whatever, it's like, let's just get you sober, right? right. I mean, it is designed for that, and it needs to be, which is why a lot of what I'm talking about here, I won't talk about it in an AAP. It's not, not the proper place for it, and that's fine. Um, but yeah, we were talk, so talking with somebody about this before we had started here tonight, and what happens is if I start talking about self-harm, cutting myself with razor blades, Invariably, someone will tell me I shouldn't talk about that here, 
Well, it turns out there are people who are self-harming in the rooms. And they come up and talk to me. I thought I was the only one who filled in the blank. Thank you for telling me I'm not alone. But people get uncomfortable probably because of their own histories. If I talk about being suicidal in AA, they go, you can't talk about being suicidal in AA. It's like, I'm going to kill myself. Why can't I? Because you're going to hurt the newcomer. It's like, what? Right? And then I talk about suicide, and someone comes up and goes, I thought I was the only one in here who wanted to kill myself. Can I talk to you about what happened to me last week? It's like, yeah, let's talk, dude. I can't talk about abusing my kids because others are abusing their kids. Like, so you're, it, it makes people uncomfortable. It, I mean, I'm not judging that. I get what's going on. Um, somebody came up to me after one of these workshops. I think it was the one we did in Spartanburg a couple years ago. And, um, and they basically challenged me, Zach. Right? They basically said, don't you think you're harming people by talking about this? And I had to really wrestle with that. I mean, I really wrestled with that. And kind of where I sit with that today, subject to revision tomorrow, right? But today is I would rather have some of you, when you run into something, say, oh, that's that stuff that guy was talking about. I need to work steps more deeply than to think that they're going to have to go off and off themselves or get loaded or whatever. So I've sort of come to that place. A guy, um, William Cope Moyers, wrote a book called Broken where he talks in the back of the book about how one of the challenges we face is that every time we try and keep this anonymous, and by the way, I'm a fan of anonymity, what we're actually at risk of doing is perpetuating the shame that gets people drunk in the first place. Where, where family relationships are concerned, the best advice I got early on was tread very lightly at first. Right? Because I think that was wise. Because I, until one cleans up enough of one's affairs spread, it's very easy to go off the rails with someone. Um, and in some cases, it's irreparable. I mean, that's, that's the, sometimes, no, sometimes we say things that can never be made right. Um, and so that's the, that's the danger. Um, I'm going to kind of go where we went earlier with the question Sal asked, is I would spend a lot of time doing inventory about the person, like really how do I feel about this, what is going on here, um, to try and really, really get comfortable and sure that what I'm going to, how I'm going to try and navigate that with someone. Interestingly enough, if you look at, this is an amazing thing, if you look at childhood trauma, what we know is that the number one predictor of better outcomes is for someone to care about you. An adult. A kid can't do it to a kid. <coughs> if an adult, so like if you've got an adult in your life who just, they're nurturing, they're safe, they're good, there's a whole lot of healing to be had there. By the way, it's sometimes why um, younger people when they come into recovery seek out someone who's older is they're looking to heal some adult relationships in there and they're looking for someone who's safe. And they aren't always safe, but that's what they're looking for. And so um, if we can find someone, and uh, a woman, she's now gone from the earth, but she was a really first rate. She did a bunch of treatment centers and everything. And she said that one of the things that AA and Alamon and ACA does really well is we reparent people, which sounds terribly pretentious. But if you, if, you, if you didn't have a good something, getting in the hands of a sponsor who's genuinely loving, nurturing, and got something to give, that's a big deal. Just like a good therapist could be that, or a good spiritual advisor. So I think the challenge, Fred, is to make sure that we're picking well. Because a lot of us have very suspect fingers for lots of reasons. So let me say a couple of things. Um, yeah, so I'm going to start with the one that I think is most important. Um, if you got provoked tonight, for whatever reason, um, I would encourage you to explore that rather than writing it off. I would encourage you to write journal before you go to bed tonight and journal in the morning when you wake up. 
because there's a strong possibility that if something got tweaked, if something got hooked, it's probably going to try and present itself to you in short order. So here's what I want to close with. I believe, based on my experience, that the purpose of this deal is to restore you to ways that you lost long, long, long ago. And that the restoration is never ending. The second step is not a done deal, it's a progressive step. The restoration to sanity that you have today can be improved upon tomorrow. And as best I can tell, it never ends. It does ask much of us sometimes, but then's the terms. If you've reached a place where you're in good shape, that is truly a magical thing. All I want you to remember is if you find yourself stuck next month, a year from now, four years from now, five years from now, I want you to remember that getting stuck is a sign of progress, not failure. It means you're being brought to the next jumping off place, which is success through the program of recovery. And it's not something we're in charge of. So if there's anything I would like you to hold on to, it's that there is more that's available to you in the way of emotional sobriety and recovery. Um, hence the title, Emotionally Sober for Life doesn't mean emotionally sober for the course of your life. It means emotionally sober to be available for the life that is looking to find you. Be. That you don't know what it is yet. And the way we do that is by cleaning the vessel so that something new can present itself. Um, I've never been more optimistic about the possibilities. Um, and that increases with every year. So. I'm delighted to have shared this time with you. If uh, if you really hate when we're done, good on you. Um, talk to your sponsor, do the inventory work, because uh, that's a good thing. And I'm happy to chat with folks after.